Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Safety Training, How to Plan Effective Strategies, sponsored by J.J. Keller. My name is Kevin Verrulli. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health magazine, and I will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. We hope you all are safe and well amid the evolving COVID-19 pandemic. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I want to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's sponsor. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. The slides for today's webcast are available for download under the Resources widget. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speakers today will be Derek Plowden and Ed Zaleski. Derek is a technical director for J.J. Keller's content and consulting services. He responds to customer questions and provides content for several publications, specializing in topics including construction regulations, ergonomics, and PPE. Ed is an EHS editor at J.J. Keller. He researches and creates content on a variety of safety-related topics and contributes to a number of products. His specialty areas include walking and working surfaces, powered industrial trucks, and injury illness record keeping. Gentlemen, we thank you for being here today. Derek, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. All righty, thank you. So as a safety professional, you know how important training is. And you also know that training takes time, it takes effort, and it takes money. But good training is well worth it as this slide's quote shows. Now we know that training, again, takes a lot of time and pulling employees away from productive work to attend training, especially if they grumble about the training, might not be something you look forward to doing. But the alternative, which is having an untrained employee in the workplace, just isn't an option and it shouldn't be. Now today we'll touch on several training methods that have proven to be effective. We'll discuss training in general and focus on the challenges that you're facing, offer some best practices, and of course, look at current trends in training that others are finding effective. Now, you can't expect employees to work safely if you haven't told them how to do that or haven't explained the hazards. Now, the effort involved in developing and presenting effective training is an investment that will pay you back in the future with fewer injuries, better morale, engaged workers, and, and lower insurance premiums, and other benefits. Now, OSHA considers effective training to mean you're providing the necessary information, and you're also providing the information in the manner that the trainee is capable of understanding and retaining. You also have to evaluate the training to make sure the information was received, understood, and remembered. Essentially, this really boils down to training that is understandable. It's got to be useful, informational-based, and of course, it's got to be memorable. Now, many of OSHA's rules have specific training requirements, and it's important to meet these requirements. But remember, OSHA only describes the minimum training required. Many employers choose to go beyond the requirements to meet a higher standard, which includes meeting industry best practices and trends. And again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. For example, though, a lot of you probably deliver training on topics that aren't specifically required by OSHA. For example, we know that many employers are giving active shooter response training, but that's not required. It's going beyond OSHA. And many employers also find it effective to provide training hazard recognition, which again, isn't required, but it's a good practice. 
All right. Now, as Derek mentioned, there's a lot of OSHA regulations that outline training requirements. But if you're searching the rules for the word train, uh, you're not going to find everything. A lot of the standards actually say things like to inform employees about something or to instruct workers on something, but they don't specifically use the word train. And in some of them, training is just a good idea. You know, for example, the machine guarding standard does not specifically mention training, but obviously training is clearly useful and even necessary. Uh, not only do train, you need to train workers maybe to recognize pinch points, but also things like how to spot a defective guard, understand how to use them. These are important things for them to know. Uh, another example is that only designated personnel can operate a crane, and the employer has to determine if a worker can be designated. That sounds an awful lot like some training would probably be needed. In addition, check if your state has training requirements that go above and beyond federal OSHA. In particular, state plan states, places like California, Oregon, Washington, even Michigan, they may have additional training requirements. In fact, some states may require OSHA 10-hour or 30-hour training to work on publicly funded construction or other projects, and even some private construction or service contractors w would want to see that workers had gone through that kind of training. So they include provisions for that kind of training. And beyond that, OSHA's general duty clause, of course, requires you to furnish a place of employment which is free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to employees. Hopefully you're all familiar with that one. Well, one way to meet that requirement is by providing training on topics that aren't covered by OSHA regulations. Uh, some areas for which OSHA doesn't have a rule or standard, but for which training might be needed, include things like heat stress, uh, materials handling lifting or ergonomic issues, even workplace violence has been cited under the General Duty Clause. So to determine what training might be required, you could conduct a hazard assessment for all aspects of your operations, your work procedures, uh, identify your exposures, and then thereby identify issues that you can probably address through training. Now, keep in mind a hazard assessment is required under the PPE standard at 1910.132. Every employer must determine if hazards are present or likely to be present which require the use of personal protective equipment or obviously that could be mitigated through you know, engineering or work practice controls. But if there are hazards, you probably need to provide some training on them. So back to what we were talking about, OSHA uh, has a lot of training requirements and determining if those exist is really the first step in analyzing your training needs. But to be effective, a lot of you we know want to go above and beyond the basics. So in addition to OSHA requirements, and any state requirements, you'll want to make sure you're meeting your company policies as well. You know, training is supposed to fill a gap in knowledge or a gap in skills. Essentially, you need to identify what the employee already knows or is able to do, and then determine what else they need to learn or know about in order to be safe. Of course, training isn't always the answer. I mean, it's important, but it's not always the best solution. For example, many of you may have had a forklift driver who's been written up two, three, four times for driving recklessly or otherwise violating the rules, going too fast. Now, this kind of thing happens, and the regulation might say the employee needs to be trained if he was observed doing something unsafe. But if it keeps happening, the problem is probably not a training issue. It might be something else that needs to be addressed. It could be that production demands are too much for the forklift driver. He feels he needs to take shortcuts. Or maybe the supervisor is aware of these violations but is not enforcing the operating rules. And in some cases, uh, you know, a forklift operator might just have the attitude that the rules don't apply to him. So those are some things to keep in mind. Thanks, Ed. Really great information so far. Let's continue on underlying causes, right? As Ed said before, if that forklift driver already knows the rules, then more training won't necessarily solve the problem. Now, you may need to sit down with the driver, find out what's going on, and address the underlying cause for the behavior. 
if production demands are so high that the driver thinks he needs to take shortcuts, then his work area might have a staffing issue. Fixing that is probably beyond your responsibilities, but it should be brought up with the right people. Now, the right people could include a supervisor, and it, of course, if the supervisor is not enforcing the rules. Everyone, including supervisors, needs to understand that following safety rules is not optional. Now, there may be production consequences if the operator drives at a slower speed, but there's going to be safety consequences if he continues driving recklessly. If managers aren't willing to enforce the rules, are they willing to deal with those consequences? And that's kind of a tough question to ask. And you've spent a lot of time training the forklift operator and making sure he follows the rules. So really take the time to make sure that those rules are enforced as well. Now we've been looking at what to train on. Now we'll turn to the more difficult issues of how to train, making training effective. And the first step is planning. Most trainers say they need up to eight hours of prep time for every hour of training. And that will include research time, it'll include preparing written materials, gathering props, of course, setting up the classroom and inviting learners. Now, if you stretch that out, it means an eight hour training program requires a lot of preparation work. The fact is, most people have pretty short attention spans, even for the most exciting of content. And we recommend limiting your content to about 45 to, oh, I'd say 50 minutes per hour with a 10 to 15 minute break before starting up again. And of course, that'll give you some more time for questions. And speaking of questions, not everyone is comfortable asking questions in front of a crowd. A good trainer tries to stick around after the session to answer questions. And you can use the time to pack up materials or stay busy in other ways and allow people to stay and ask questions. And that might require blocking your schedule, again, for a half hour after the training session, just to make sure you don't need to run off for another meeting. All right, thanks, Derek. Now, when it comes to training, you know, following the regulations, staying in compliance, these are important things, but we know you want to go above and beyond the minimum requirements. So having the right tools and resources is certainly beneficial uh, when it comes to developing and maintaining your training programs. Uh, one of our sponsors for today is J.J. Keller Safety Management Suite. So we'd like to give all our attendees you know, access to this award-winning training program. It has customizable training resources, including PowerPoint presentations, uh, five-minute safety talks, some classroom exercises, there's quizzes and more. Uh, if we advance the slide, a poll should appear on your screen. And along with your trial, we would send you a free white paper, OSHA Safety Training Basics. And while you take a moment to address that, I do want to take one question that has come in. Uh, one of our listeners said that we mentioned training on general hazard recognition and wondering what that would cover. Uh, well, essentially, you would work to train employees to recognize general hazards rather than the more specific training of, say, you know, in running nip points or other hazards in the workplace, you know, something specific. Uh, one way to show them this is maybe to take photos in the workplace to use as kind of a what's wrong exercise. Frankly, if you do internet searches, you can show the wrong, what's wrong photos that you'll find online. Some of them are very obvious, but this can help your, your workers get a better grip on uh, what a hazard looks like, and, and if they see things like this in the workplace that they should report it. Another option, frankly, is to use maybe one of your monthly training sessions and invite your workers along, just do a walkthrough of their area of the facility, and just through a walkthrough, see if they can point out or identify any hazards. And again, if you have even simple housekeeping issues, cardboard boxes out of place, uh, wet floors, things like that, these are things that should not be acceptable as a normal condition in the workplace. They should be recognized and addressed. So you start to build up their hazard recognition just in general that way. All right, let's move on now, and we're going to talk about the, uh, some of the top training problems that we have. Uh, when we ask about training problems, uh, people often come up with a list similar to what you see here. Uh, first of all, of course, the content may not be relevant, and that can mean a lot of different things. Uh, trainees do need to feel that the training is important 
but it also needs to be relevant to them. Does it provide the material and information they need and relate to what they're doing? General hazard recognition training can be good, of course, but if training is too generalized, it won't make sense to them. Second, is that material up to date? Uh, if you've been in a presentation where photos included fashions and hairstyles from the 1980s, uh, it's hard to take that seriously and it can be a distraction. I've actually seen photos in training with dial telephones in them, which you have not seen in a long time. Number three, of course, is that the information may be too technical, uh, just over their heads, and, and trainees don't understand it. If they don't understand it, they're not going to retain it. So you need to speak at their level. You need to know their reading ability, uh, maybe their math skills, their vocabulary level. As safety professionals, we, we easily get carried away with jargon and acronyms and other terms uh, that using government speak, for example, and when we're talking about the OSHA standards. Um, your trainees may not have that background. Number four, of course, is if it's not in the trainee's language. Uh, obviously, if employees need to translate what you're saying or what they're reading while they're trying to learn, they're not going to understand or remember it quite as well uh, and what you're trying to teach them. Number five, of course, your trainer needs to be qualified to teach the material. Now, some OSHA regulations require the trainer to have specific knowledge and experience. Uh, for example, the walking working surfaces regulation requires a qualified trainer, not just a competent person. A qualified in that case means someone who has the education and experience to answer questions and solve problems that trainees may have. Uh, number six, of course, training can be boring, uh, especially if it's not interactive. To be effective, uh, you should require trainees to answer questions. This is why teachers in class call on students. Uh, if they can solve problems, you can present them a scenario. Again, what's wrong with this picture are great solutions or get some hands-on time using equipment. Because just sitting still and listening is going to be a challenge for a lot of people when you start to see those yawns in the room. And number seven, of course, if it doesn't meet their needs. So ask yourself, what do the trainees need to get out of the training, and what is their preferred learning style? Now, some people learn best by seeing. Others learn better by hearing. And a lot of people are hands-on. They need to handle something uh, to really grasp a concept. But really good programs try to incorporate all three of those learning styles. And of course, finally, keep in mind if any trainees have special needs. Uh, if a worker has a, a vision restriction or a hearing impairment, uh, that might require a little special training, planning, and awareness on your part. All right, so we mentioned trainer qualifications, and we do get questions on this fairly often. In most cases, OSHA does not require that an instructor complete a specific training course or obtain a particular certification. Instead, the regulations describe the knowledge and skills the trainer must possess. Now, typically, that is gained through education, maybe they've taken some courses, uh, some experience on the job, or some combination of both. Uh, to give a few examples, the Powered Industrial Truck Regulation says that training must be conducted by persons who have the knowledge, training, and experience to train operators and evaluate their competence. Now, in some other guidance, OSHA clarified that the instructor must have experience with the equipment or truck type in order to provide that training. So they don't have to be a regular operator, but they should have operated the equipment at some point. Another example, bloodborne pathogen standard is very general and it just says the trainer shall be knowledgeable in the subject matter covered as it relates to the workplace. Well, that can be tough to pull out, but OSHA did clarify that the trainer does not necessarily need to be a healthcare professional. <laughs> However, if there are deficiencies in the quality of the training, OSHA has said it may question the trainer's background or qualifications. Uh, of course, having the knowledge and experience alone is not necessarily enough to make a good trainer. All right, thanks, Ed. And before I continue, I just want to know one thing. You know, training is difficult, you know, in its own right, but especially when you're training adults at a certain level, um, things can get really hard, so it's important to understand what certain things you need to have within your training program. And one thing that we've discovered 
um, is that there are several characteristics really that, that learners have. And, and generally it's that most learners, they want to utilize a certain knowledge uh, and skill that they've learned right after they've learned it, right? So rather than waiting um, in practice to um, have a trainee learn something, um, teach them or have them practice that right after you've taught them something. Another thing is that they're very interested in learning new concepts and principles. They enjoy situations that require problem solving, not necessarily learning facts. Um, adults specifically learn better if they are active participants, again, rather than passive learners. They also want to relate to the new material that they learn based on their own past experiences. And this, again, goes into um, asking your trainees personal questions about um, their own experiences within work that they've done before. This might help them get more engaged into what they're learning. Um, and of course, you know, it'd be best if they're able to proceed um, at a reasonable pace. Again, motivation is increased when the content is relevant. Um, it's immediate interests and concerns. Um, it addresses those things to trainees right away. A training environment that uses discussion and practice skills again, with a reduction really in lecture time, can be very, very effective. Both trainees and the instructor should be active uh, in that learning process if, if that's how it's going. So let's continue. The, the instructor must be able to convey information, as I said, in an engaging manner, and be able to answer those questions from trainees. And the instructor may benefit from training on how to develop and present material how to understand audiences, and of course, how to appeal to different learning styles, as I said earlier. But just because a trainer has the knowledge and experience doesn't mean they are comfortable delivering the training. If the trainer is new or isn't comfortable speaking in front of a group, having them practice is key. Remind your trainers that everyone fumbles, everyone makes mistakes once in a while. Nobody's perfect. Trainers should expect to be interrupted with questions during the presentation. And this is a good thing. This is a good problem to have. The more questions you have, the more interested and engaged your learners are. And again, you should really encourage those interruptions. Now, you can always team up trainers. For example, if one is really good at presenting uh, the classroom portion of a forklift training and another is better at the hands-on training, they can work together to deliver that training. Now, not everyone is knowledgeable in every topic. Uh, know when to seek outside help, and this could mean hiring a consultant, using online training, or any other number of solutions that you may find. Now, another challenge is that different people have different learning styles, and sometimes these relate to the age of the trainees. Now, there are many stereotypes that go along with different generations, and a few that come to mind um, are that older workers don't like change, and Younger workers can't put down their phones. Now, while these stereotypes may not be totally true, the fact is that there are differences in the way different age groups prefer to learn. Older workers often do prefer a classroom setting with lots of verbal explanations and written instructions. They also want to know the why of the training, and it will help if they can relate the material to their experiences. Younger employees tend to want more interaction digital-based learning and smaller chunks of information at a time. Now that said, some trainees' attention spans are relatively short, and some have a hard time sitting for long periods. Maybe they've got health-related back issues, which can often be a big problem for workers performing strenuous jobs. Or they just like their hands-on job and don't like sitting. And while one rule of thumb, is to have no more than three objectives per hour or even less. A trend in training is called microlearning, where you set one objective and train on it for just a few minutes. It's hard to do and many trainers hate it, uh, but it can be very effective. Now, now, what's the idea here? The idea is that the trainees can access quick training programs where and when they need to, such as on a phone or tablet quickly absorb that information and then continue on with their jobs. And this gives people more control over what they learn. Microlearning is most effective at 10 minutes or less, addressing just one learning objective. If you have a lengthy topic, you break it into chunks. 
Now, micro learning can take many forms from a podcast to something like an animated video. All right. Now, Derek covered some of the generational differences, but you may have a workforce with people from different cultures as well or other backgrounds, and you also need to be sensitive to those differences. Uh, you may need to identify any barriers or obstacles that might exist to you know, their ability to absorb the training. People from different backgrounds may approach learning differently or have different expectations from the trainer. For example, uh, people from some cultures might think that asking a question is a challenge to the authority of the trainer. Or some people might not speak up in front of a group. Uh, these, these can be cultural differences. Even language barriers, as we mentioned earlier, could be a challenge. Uh, so there's a number of reasons that individuals might not understand the training, but they won't always let you know, whether it's because they're embarrassed or it's a cultural thing. And so one sign might be that you're not getting any questions. Ideally, that means everyone's grasped everything and they've got a great idea and you're doing a fantastic job. Uh, but it might also mean that your trainees are not paying attention, uh, or it might mean that they just aren't willing to speak up. So another common challenge is trainees, uh, as we said, who don't speak English or who don't speak English as their first language. In those cases, you may need to use an interpreter or find internal trainers or training helpers who do speak multiple languages and use a common vocabulary, not something highly technical or jargon heavy. Those terms can be difficult to translate ac accurately to other languages, actually. So find a way to communicate at an appropriate level without talking down to the audience, because otherwise you're going to risk putting them to sleep. Uh, it can be difficult to discover if your trainees have poor reading skills. Uh, this is a very personal subject. Some people have been dealing with it for a lifetime, whether they have difficulty with the language because it's not their primary, or they have a condition like dyslexia that makes it difficult. But trainers do need to be sensitive to those learners and using a variety of training techniques, again, visual and audio as well, instead of just written materials, can be the key to reaching these people. And even f physical abilities uh, can be a, a factor. Again, trainers need to be alert to any special needs. So as an example, if you have a trainee with a hearing impairment, you might need to focus more on visual cues or provide written translations for that person. Of course, another challenge is new hires. Uh, a lot of you have probably gone through the process of teaching a teenager how to drive a car. Now, as you know, these kids have to pass a written test to get their temporary license, and then they have to spend a number of hours driving behind the wheel with an instructor and with a parent to get some experience. But even with that practice, uh, a teenager can panic or freeze when they encounter a new situation. So this is what it can be like for new hires or temporary workers. Sometimes when you don't know what to do, uh, they'll try something and it's not always the right answer. So of course, new hires do need training, but even when it's delivered, some studies have shown that employees during the first about four weeks at a new job, they are three times the risk of injury compared to seasoned employees, and that's for a serious injury. And new hires can come with other issues. Uh, classroom training isn't always effective because there's so much to learn in such a short time. Or safety orientation might be bundled in with things like 401k and benefits and health plans and all this other stuff. Uh, so one effective strategy is to pair a new hire with a more experienced worker on the job. And then you can reevaluate and provide further training or reinforcement training on an as-needed basis. Now, of course, temporary workers can also be a challenge. Again, these workers are more likely to be injured on the job, and OSHA has been focusing on them. We talked about new hires, but let's face it, trained temps from a staffing agency can be new employees multiple times per year. Now, OSHA has said that both the staffing agency and the host employer share some responsibility for providing their training. With temps, you want to work out the expectations for the job and schedule training ahead of time as part of the contract with the staffing agency. Now remember, 
OSHA will expect temporary workers to be trained on the specific hazards at your facility, not just on general hazards. So even if they've got experience driving a forklift, you would still need to show them any particular pedestrian areas, railroad tracks, or other low hazards, things like that at your facility. And of course, for injury and illness record keeping, you are generally responsible for recording the injuries to temps, and that's assuming you provide the day-to-day -day supervision. In most cases, a company that uses temps will describe how it wants the work done, which means they're providing that day-to-day -day supervision. And another item is that supervisors might want to assign a temp to jobs that they haven't been trained for. Uh, you know, even if the supervisor provides real quick training, performing a different type of work might actually be outside the scope of your contract with the staffing agency. So that's something they need to keep in mind as well. I think that let's talk about who needs who needs training. And not all employees need the same training. Employees who never work with hazardous waste don't need hazardous waste training, right? A worker who is never going to operate a forklift, again, for example, doesn't need forklift training. But that worker might need reminders to walk in designated pedestrian aisles and to listen for forklifts in a warehouse where forklifts are used. We do get questions on which regulations require training and what training employers must provide. Well, a lot of regulations, to be honest, require training, and others imply a need for training, as we covered earlier. However, the exact training each employer must provide depends on its operations. If employees use hazardous chemicals, they probably need HAZCOM training. Now, each employer must determine which regulations apply, then determine if that regulation requires that training. And of course, you want to keep in mind that it's not just workers who need training. Managers need to know and understand the importance of it. And that includes how injury and illness costs impact the company's bottom line and how safety can boost productivity and quality. You need their buy-in. All of your managers and supervisors should be able to tell you how safety impacts the business. And in addition, they should also have a good idea of how their department is doing in terms of injury costs at any given time. Now, it's also important to understand that managers and supervisors must not discourage employees from reporting injuries or reporting illnesses. Supervisors should be trained in how to enforce safety consistently. And vendors working on site may also need to be trained on the specific hazards at your facility. Now, supervisors might benefit from going through the same training as their employers, or their employees, rather. After all, if they're supposed to enforce safety rules, they need to know those rules, too. In addition, they may need training on the importance of enforcing the rules, and even tips on how to give reminders. Giving them a few examples of how to approach an employee will make their job easier. Now, a supervisor might give one or two verbal reminders, but they should document the date and topic of the reminder. Otherwise, they might forget who they spoke to and when they had the conversation. Now, after that, after that first few couple of reminders, that they'll need to understand and start writing up employees for violations. Moving on to written discipline can be uncomfortable, but Ask them if they'd be more comfortable driving an employee to the hospital. Safety is, of course, serious business after all. Now, we also get questions on which regulations require annual refresher training. And there are quite a few. Among them are occupational noise exposure, HAZWOPR, respiratory protection, fire brigades, portable fire extinguishers, and bloodborne pathogens, but there are also others. In addition, some standards require evaluations. By evaluations, we mean like three-year evaluations of forklift operators. Some regulations don't mention refresher training, but do require reviews, and of course, these reviews include certain things like periodic inspections under the lockout-takeout standard. Now, even when where refresher training is not required, um, providing it may be a good idea. 
if employees cannot answer questions about the training they received, your company could be cited for failure to provide training. Another question that we often get, um, or another, you know, answer that we provide customers with questions with who have this question is, you know, can they be cited um, for that failure to provide training? Yes, they can. And if the training was delivered several years ago, don't expect employees to remember all the specific details. There's classroom programs that you can uh, train employees, of course. All right, thank you, Derek. You know, you're talking about uh, refresher training, the the regulations with annual refresher training, and I wanted to get into that a little bit because I know that some of you uh, have been unable to do some of the annual training or testing because of COVID shutdowns. Hopefully, you're all aware that OSHA issued guidance and way back in well April, and then re upped it in March, uh, or excuse me, in April and re upped it in May. That uh, if you're unable to deliver annual training or conduct tests because of COVID shutdowns, that if you document your good faith efforts, um, OSHA will take that in consideration when enforcing those requirements. So in particular, employers had difficulty, say, conducting annual audiometric tests as part of a hearing protection program because they couldn't get their employees on site or couldn't get a medical professional, or uh, conducting annual respirator fit testing getting third parties to come into the workplace or sending employees somewhere to, to handle those things was getting to be a challenge. And those are unusual ones in that they do require some in-person. Now, some of the other training areas that Derek listed, you know, like bloodborne pathogens, do require annual refresher, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in-person. In fact, OSHA has consistently said for years that online training certainly can work it's just that in most cases where you deliver online training, uh, the instructor does need to be immediately available to answer any questions. So OSHA said, well, email can be okay, but it's not going to be if the person gets a response an hour later. It's got to be more instantaneous. So a lot of online training courses or online delivery will still meet those requirements, particularly if you have a trainer right there, you know, delivering the program remotely. So this still works. Now, of course, OSHA does want your training to impact employees well enough so that they remember what they learned. Now, often that's easier said than done, so we're going to go through a few tips here. First, it's important to repeat key ideas over and over, you know, not just during training, but as reminders. A lot of you probably have things like uh, signs or posters up in the workplace, even if it's things like hearing protection required in this area. Uh, you try and come up with slogans. Everybody uses things like safety first or different slogans that they've tried to come up with um, in order to emphasize the importance. These are phrases that keep uh, everyone, everyone can easily keep in mind. It's kind of the click it or ticket seatbelt type of thing too. And again, short micro learning modules are great for getting a point across. They're also great for refreshers. Uh, but for truly memorable training, again, think about those visual cues, those signs in the workplace, again, to wear eye protection or hearing protection are a good example. Another one, markings on the floor that say watch for forklift traffic, or you've seen the yellow markings on the edge of stairs or ramps. Those are to remind employees that there's a hazard coming up. So you probably have other cues in your workplace as reminders to employees, and that's essentially a part of training. Then, of course, you want your training to be innovative. Now, coming up with new and innovative techniques is always a good thing. Uh, you want to make sure your training is still effective, though. In other words, you want to know that it works, that everybody's paying attention, that they're remembering what they're, what they're being taught. Now, one example training technique is to use a tabletop exercise to mimic the activity that trainees will be performing. Uh, this isn't always easy, but I mean, I went through 40 hour Hazwopper training years ago, and we would actually suit up in the room, you know, put on the respirators, things like that. It gives you a hands on feeling for it, even though you're not out in the real world, you know, working with hazardous chemicals. Another example, as I mentioned before, is having learners identify a what's wrong with this picture. Um, we've got a number of samples in Safety Management Suite that you see here, and we provide them with some other training materials. And photos are a great one. Frankly, again, if you can take photos in your own workplace, that works really well. And 
actually trainees pay more attention when they say, hey, there's Bob on the forklift or whatever. When they see each other in the workplace, um, that can actually get them to pay attention. It might not be for the exact reason you want, but hey, you've got them looking at that photo and seeing what's going wrong. And then, of course, conducting some tests. Uh, giving a test before a training session is a great way to measure their knowledge, and testing afterward, of course, uh, helps them helps you determine what they've retained. Now, we, we get a lot of questions on exams that we provide, quizzes we provide, on how many questions someone can get wrong. That's really up to you. Uh, 70, 80 percent is standard, but, I mean, if you want to let someone go with 60 percent, sometimes the quiz just helps you identify material where the the trainees weren't quite getting it, and maybe it just means you need to spend a little more time going over that, and as you go over the quiz, you can cover that material a second time. And of course, if you need to cover something again, you can always circle back with trainees, maybe a couple of weeks later. Talk to the learners, ask them some questions, see what they've retained. In fact, going back six months or even a year later to follow up is probably a good idea. Maybe new questions have come up since the last time uh, they, ha they talked to you, they may have questions they didn't think to ask, or they may have forgotten something that's critical and maybe they'll need to use it next week. So all that follow-up is, is a really good idea. And I'm going to turn it back to Derek. Thanks, Ed. It's so important to keep a record of each employee's training, even if it's not man mandated by the regulations. And why is that? Well, that's because training records prove to an OSHA inspector that you've done the training. You know, some OSHA standards require you to keep specific information such, such as the employee name, the trainer name, uh, and the signature, and the time and date that the training was delivered. Other standards just call for the topic, the name of the trainer, the date, and the name of the employee. Most standards require that the employee understands the, the training. This may mean that you offer a pre-test and a post-test, or you might talk to the workers in a week and ask a few questions. Keep in mind that OSHA inspectors may question employees to determine if they understand safety training. So taking time to quiz your employees before an inspector arrives may be a good idea. And I see we even have a question here uh, in, in the chat, you know, do employees have to sign the document uh, to prove attendance in a training session? Uh, this is one thing that might be a good practice. Again, you could get employee signatures uh, confirming that they have been in attendance, and it's even a good idea to ask employees for signatures to confirm that they've understood the training. And <clears throat> you can even provide that uh, post after that, too. Now, training records can also be a valuable tool for your entire safety and health program. Share your records with supervisors and management to use during employee performance reviews. Employees who are well-trained may be ready to take on more responsibilities. The supervisor should review training records before assigning workers to tasks that require specialized training. On the flip side, if you see an employee performing a task and you don't remember training that person, then you can check your records to quickly find out if the employee is qualified to do the work. The records are a big help if you need to retrain at periodic intervals. Keeping up with refresher training schedules can be a big challenge. And you can also use training records in your accident investigation. If you don't have records, you won't know if a lack of training might have anything to do with the incident. Okay, so let's recap here a bit. In today's webcast, we talked about OSHA's requirements for training. Uh, we talked about average company's training budget. Uh, we talked about top seven training problems, top learning challenges, and employee training and record keeping requirements. Now, Ed, I'm gonna ask, do you have anything to add before we move into questions? Well, yeah, one more. You know, obviously we're talking about how training is a, is a crucial element in a compliance program. And earlier we were talking, how many regulations have training? Well, there's actually more than 160 regulations that include training requirements. And we want to make sure you're covering everything. So we want to give you the opportunity to check out our training center in safety management suite. Now, we had a poll up before. If, we didn't, if you didn't elect your free trial, we're giving you one more chance. Uh, the J.J. Keller Safety Management Suite does provide access to hundreds of award-winning training programs, 
and thousands of customizable training resources. There's, again, PowerPoint presentations that are ready to use or can be modified for your needs, brief five-minute safety talks that are nice refreshers, some classroom exercises, again, quizzes, things like that. So let's put that poll up one more time and uh, let us know your interest. And again, we can send you a white paper on OSHA safety training basics. You know, another very popular part of the safety management suite we have is a feature called uh, training at a glance. It lists all the OSHA training requirements uh, th through general industry. There's a separate page for construction. So you can just scroll right down and see 1910-178, what are the forklift training requirements? What are the bloodborne training requirements? Um, even the industry specific. So it's one of our more popular features. And with that, I know we have a, a little time left to go through questions. I'm going to kick over. I think Kevin's coming back on to push some of these questions for us. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, and great job, Derek and Ed, both of you. We thank you for your, your insights and expertise. Um, before we do start the Q&A, just want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen now. Your input's important because it'll help us uh, improve uh, future webcasts. If you do not happen to see the evaluation survey on your screen, uh, please do turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. And then also while we're doing some reminders, once again, if you've not um, downloaded today's, um, today's slides, they are available to you under the resources widget. And with that, we will now get to some questions. First one says, being unable to complete the FIT testing annual requirement because of a third party not willing to come on site, et cetera, due to COVID. So that's their current situation. And the questioner asks, what does OSHA say about an employer that's capable of completing this annual requirement, has the equipment and supplies needed, but also is one member of the safety department, read the OSHA letters as a complete exemption? Ooh, that's that's a tough one. Um, yeah, and you know, OSHA offered some compliance deferral if you made good faith efforts to comply. In fact, that, I believe that's what the I managed to open up the guidance here when I was talking about that. It talks about it's titled. It's actually dated April 16th, and it's titled "Discretion in Enforcement When Considering an Employer's Good Faith Efforts." If you have, I mean, it talks about if you've been in good faith to meet the requirements and, and your attempts to do so. So, I mean, if you have the capability to deliver that in-house, uh, then OSHA is going to consider that uh, as, as when they're determining whether to issue a citation. So this is not a complete exemption. This is just sort of, I wouldn't, I used the word deferral earlier, probably not the best term to use. But essentially, OSHA said, you know, their compliance officers will take into consideration your good faith efforts to meet the, the, those obligations uh, when determining whether to issue a fine or, or, frankly, the amount of that fine. If you're able to do it, you know, you're, and again, you're supposed to document what your efforts were that you were unable to do it. Uh, you know, we contacted this company, they, they refused to come on site, whatever it was. But if you're actually able to do it, uh, my understanding is they're, they're going to cite it as they would normally, as if there were no COVID situation, because there's no particular reason that you're unable to conduct that, uh, those tests. So, yeah, those are still required. You know, as a related one to that, we get questions on fit testing. Respirator fit testing is required annually. One of the reasons is people may, cha may change. They may gain a lot of weight. They may lose weight. I think it facial scarring. Other things can happen that, that affect how respirator fits. Um, related one of that we get is medical fit tests required annually. Those are not. Medical evaluations are not required annually unless the healthcare professional recommends them to ensure that someone can continue safely wearing a respirator. There's a few other places where you might need to do a medical test follow-up. Um, you know, an employee reports problems breathing while wearing a respirator, for example. But otherwise, these annual fit testing things, yeah, OSHA says if you're able to do it, you should be doing it, basically. So I hope that answers it, and you may need to run through what the, uh, what the document actually says. What else you got, Kevin? Next question asked. We got our, our next question coming in. says, is the Good Samaritan rule the best to use in giving first aid these days or just call the paramedics due to liability? I'm happy to take that one too if that's okay. Um, 
You know, the Good Samaritan rule is essentially an exception. So the first aid provisions of the OSHA regs are a little unusual. 1910-151 says that in the absence of an infirmary or clinic nearby and et cetera, et cetera, you may need someone trained to render first aid. Oddly enough, 151 does not require that person to provide first aid. OSHA cannot tell your employees what to do. So you may need to have someone trained in first aid, but you might still need to call paramedics. Now, if you, as the employer, tell that trained person, we expect you to provide assistance to injured per people, now we're under the bloodborne pathogens rule because they have occupational exposure or reasonably anticipated occupational exposure. Now we're under 1910-1030. That's where the Good Samaritan rule comes in. Um, if someone attempts to render assistance, whether they're trained or not, but they're not expected to do so, you have a Good Samaritan exemption. And it's really tough, uh, you know, do you tell someone who's not designated that they should not try to help someone? I don't know. I think the Good Samaritan protection rules that states have put in are, are designed for that situation. We do recommend, however, that whether you have trained first aid providers or not, you can let people know if they intend to act as a Good Samaritan, uh, you know, they should understand the risks to themselves. They're, unless, unless you've got an employee who's a volunteer EMT after work or something like that, they may not understand the risks of trying to help. Uh, good Samaritan rules also help if someone inadvertently does more harm than good. Um, so, yeah, if if you can call the paramedics, obviously that's that's the ideal solution to get the professionals involved as quickly as possible. Again, because of certain situations, location, availability of help, you may need to have someone trained to render first aid under 1910-151. And then if you designate that person to provide assistance under 1910-1030, bloodborne pathogens, they need additional training. Um, but yeah, if someone untrained tries to respond as a good Samaritan, they're essentially exempt from those other requirements. Uh, otherwise, it kind of comes down to the state laws. So again, I guess I'm telling you, don't, don't necessarily tell people not to help if they're able to do so. Um, you know, People may want to help, but if at least tell them, make sure they understand the risks to themselves as a good Samaritan if they are trying to help. So I hope that goes. All right, our next question says, uh, what suggestions would you have on tracking training for a large amount, say 1,500 employees? That is a lot of employees. Um, for such a large number of employees, you know, Derek Derek took the question earlier about having people sign their names, but um, again, that's that's not necessarily required. OSHA would say you need you might need to record the names of the employees, but whether you're delivering online training or or um, doing this in various in person training, uh, if if they've attended an online course, for example, or otherwise that you've recorded that their names has it, or excuse me, recorded that their names that they has they have completed the course. Uh, that should be sufficient. Um, a long list of names. I, I don't remember if you remember. Some of you might remember when they would pass around a sign-up sheet at the start of the class. Um, that's a way to get everybody's name on there, rather than taking a roll call, and you end up with a signature. But otherwise, there needs to be perhaps, if you're delivering electronically, an electronic way to track that. Is if you're, I'm assuming you're delivering training electronically. But yeah, otherwise, if it's in person, it, you don't need individual signatures. Um, but it's going to depend on your your training system. You know, some of our systems that we offer, like SMS Safety Management Suite, they they help you track that, so you can get large numbers of people and get reminders of when they need refresher. But a, a, a learning management system, on a, a robust one, is probably where you need to be. Next question asks: What kind of content must be supplied for annual hearing training? Is a handout with applicable education sufficient? For annual hearing training? Oh, yeah, yeah. We talked about fit testing um, for respirators and hearing protection. That's one of the the uh, refreshers. Um, I think it's it's largely a repeat of the initial training. Usually, refresher training can be a little bit more brief, but... Um, 
I'm afraid that's not one of my areas of expertise. I don't know if Derek has more on that. I'm not sure. Maybe I can pass that to him. But the hearing protection training standard is, is not one of my primary areas. Yeah, and as far as I'm concerned, Ed, there's nothing really in specific that OSHA provides, you know, employers in terms of what needs to be included or what specific kinds of content or, you know, whether or not handouts even are applicable um, in, uh, in applicable education for hearing conservation program, really a lot of it just com comes down to, you know, what what specifically will that handout cover? Um, you know, you need to make sure you address a lot of things, you know, within your hearing conservation program, especially as it, re you know, relates to training, you know, in terms of, you know, what's occupational noise exposure, you know, what, what monitoring um, specifically for employers is required. Um, you know, do employees know that they need to report any specific um, types of unwanted noise um, you know, audio metric testing, let them know about that, baseline audiograms, all of these sorts of things that go into the education of of, of employees in, in your hearing conservation program. All right, thank you guys. Uh, next question, are any OSHA training requirements capable of being met through online training without an instructor being present? Oh, that's a tough one. Usually where training needs to be delivered, um, there's going to be a need for an instructor to be available because if people have questions. And I don't know that there's specific exemptions to that. Obviously, if you're doing training that's not mandated by OSHA um, because it's a best practice, then you may you may be able to get away with that. But otherwise, most of the letters of interpretation, there's several of them over, over the years, have said that it, you can deliver training online but if individuals have questions, um, then they need to have an instructor available. A lot of the online training that we see is, is non-mandatory. Uh, people do ergonomics training. Again, they do active shooter training. Uh, they may do refresher training that where refresher training isn't required. Like hazard communication, HASCOM doesn't require refresher training. But if you wanted to deliver it, you could do so online and not have an instructor present because it's not required. So there might be situations like that, but in any case where training is mandated by OSHA or refresher training is mandated, you're usually going to need an instructor present. All right, I believe you, excuse me, believe you covered it in your remarks just now about refresher training, but had a related question asking, does online training qualify for all refresher safety trainings or are there some that must be done in person? Uh, yeah, that's a little bit different. Um, usually training doesn't need to be done in person. There may be situations, again, where it's impossible uh, to do this uh, online. Uh, you know, forklift safety training requires <laughs> handling the, the, the machine, so it, it can't be done online. So some of them have to be done in person. But, but otherwise, yeah, if it's possible to deliver it online, that will usually qualify for a, a refresher as well as an initial. Uh, staying, staying with this, sort of, um, this asks, what about other hands-on type training, um, such as fire extinguisher, confined space rescue, audiometric testing, et cetera? What's acceptable as a, a good faith effort? The, the questioner explains that we're physically able to complete these trainings, and yet one member of the safety department is using COVID as a reason to not complete the trainings. Accommodations can be made for small groups and mask wearing, but just they're asking for a little feedback with their situation. Oh yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I've got the, like I said, I've got the letter up. Um, actually, if you if you look online for, uh, just look for OSHA COVID, you'll get OSHA's COVID page, and they do have their good faith enforcement document right there on the home page of their, their of that topic page, and that's where you need to go through and and see what the what the document says. It's not that long, but I don't really have time to read it while I'm trying to take questions here. I don't want to spend too much time on it either, but. But that's where this should describe some of their enforcement efforts in evaluating good faith. Again, if you, it's hard to find in LOIs, but OSHA's COVID page has it linked right from the home page as an enforcement memo. So I hope that helps. Okay. Well, uh, sounds like we've got time for just one more question. It asks, do I need an IH to perform sampling per OSHA, or can a competent safety professional perform basic uh, IH calculations? Oh, you're talking industrial hygiene. Um, usually they're sampling for air contaminants, uh, sometimes noise, things like that. 
Um, having an having an IH is probably best, but I mean, I don't. I'm not aware that OSHA specifically requires a, an industrial hygienist. Again, usually what the regulations talk about is the qualifications of the person doing it. So if there's qualifications listed in the regulations, and again, they're vague, you know, if you have the knowledge and experience to do it, then theoretically you don't need the IH certification because, um, again, OSHA doesn't specifically require a particular course be followed or a certification be obtained in order to be qualified. So it depends on whether you feel the person is qualified to do that. And if they are, sure, you can do that. Well, again, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded on to our speakers. Once again, uh, we hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback. We, we really do appreciate it for further webcasts. Uh, with that, we'll end today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Derek Plowden, Ed Zaleski, everyone at JJ Keller, and all of you who listened in. Thanks, and have a great day.